murder was imminent. Mildred Muhammad knew for sure after years of psychological abuse and having her ex-husband kidnap their three kids for 18 months, the man she married had become a distant memory. Yet while the local and national news solely concentrated on the looming D.C. sniper who had already murdered 10 people, Mildred had no idea it was her ex-husband making his way to her. When we return, I will sit down with my friend Mildred Muhammad, author, advocate, international speaker, survivor, and ex-wife of John Muhammad, convicted and now executed DC sniper. So stay tuned. Drop the bomb. We come to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We gonna drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We gonna drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We come to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound, a journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Sound bombing. I'm your host, Lamar Darnell Shields. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, our team wants to bring to you exciting guests with extraordinary stories and messages of hope and triumph. And today's guest is no exception. She is Mildred Muhammad. And if you lived in the D.C. and Maryland area between September 20,002 and October 20,002, you would know that Mildred Muhammad's ex husband, John Allen Muhammad, and Lee Boy Malvo coordinated shootings that killed 10 people and injured three in sniper-style shootings. Eventually, John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo were arrested, tried, and convicted for the shootings. Muhammad received a death sentence and was executed on November 10th, 2009, while Lee Boyd Malvo is serving a life sentence in Virginia. Mildred, finally welcome to the show. How are you doing? Y'all just don't know the behind the scenes. Your boy kept messing that intro. But Mildred is my friend, so she has allowed me to make all of these errors. Mildred, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? Well, welcome to Sound Bombing. I am just so excited about this interview. Uh, as I said to you off camera, um, on, while you were coming in, I told my mother that I was going to be sitting down with you. And she was like, you know this lady? I'm like, yeah, I know. I mean, we, we met years ago. Um, didn't know that we were going to meet and then eventually work together. Right. So when, you know, and sometimes when you have people on your show, you always say, well, this is my friend. I know I'd have been in this lady's house. We done, we done had great conversations. Um, so welcome, uh, welcome to Sound Bombing, uh, and welcome, welcome to, um, to the show. Let me tell you how we, you and I got connected. Okay. So I was uh, about to do a TV interview on, uh, ABC News. Uh, okay. at the time, I was hosting one of the largest youth conferences uh, in Maryland, um, and we we did this conference for over five years. I mean, we had a thousand kids from all over the country come to Baltimore, and so um, that morning I was about to do an interview to let people know. I think that year Tupac Shakur's mother was coming, so kids were excited. DJ Quicksilver, who's a great radio personality, he was going to be performing, and we had some other speakers. And I go to sit down. It was first of all, I was mad. It was five a.m. I'm like, man, why the hell do I need to be up this early for a dog or interview for the dog for the kids? But I'm doing it for the kids. Right. So I sit down. We do makeup as early. You know, I probably got eye crust in my eyes and all of that. I sit down in the chair, and I can't remember the guy that was about to interview me. Then all of a sudden, they take my mic. They <laughs> unmic me. Um, you know, I'm like, yo, what's going on? Then they they break. There's breaking news. And I'm like, what happened? It's like 6 a.m., 5 a.m., what could happen? And they said the D.C. sniper struck um, the the bus driver, uh, and I think in Montgomery County, mm-hmm. was just shot. And so, of course, I mean, I'm being, I'm, I'm laughing about that process, but someone's life of being shot uh, was serious. But again, it just sort of just took me to another situation because I'm, I'm here about to talk about this work with young people. And then years later, you and I meet in D.C., uh, we're speaking at 
uh, I want to say a, a conference around domestic violence or domestic abuse. Right. Uh, you might have been a keynote speaker. I might, I don't know. One of us was speaking. And when I heard them say that you were going to be there, and, you know, I hate to use the word like celebrity. I was I was blown away that you were there because, you know, you hear about this case. It's really, really close to you. I'm from Chicago, but I'm living in Maryland and people are concerned about it. And so now you and I are sitting together. Right. We, we've done work together. We're going to continue to do some work together. Um, and so that's sort of our connection. And now we're now we're sort of connected. So let's 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 talk about um, when did you when did you find out that your ex-husband was the so-called D.C. sniper? October 23rd. OK. AT, the ATF and the FBI came by my home. And they said, is Mildred Muhammad here? No. Yeah, black folks, ATF, <laughs> FBI, BET, CNN, anybody with labels, Negroes get nervous. <laughs> I said, no, she's not here. Mm -hmm. He said, well, we're here to ask her some questions about John Allen Muhammad. Okay. And so I said, well, okay, that's me. They asked, when was the last time you seen him? I said, October, I said, September 2001 at an emergency custody hearing in Tacoma, Washington. They said, well, you've not spoken to him or seen him then? I said, no, I haven't. They said, well, we need for you to come down to the police station. My hands started sweating. I said, I'm not going nowhere with y'all. They said, but why not? I said, because. I've been trying to tell you that John is going to kill me and nobody believes me. So I'm not going with you to say, Miss Muhammad, we don't have him at the police station. We just need for you to come down to answer a few questions. So I went and I told my children that I'm going to the police station with the, with the police officers, but I'll let you know what happened. So we're driving to the police station. We come in to boat to Mora because it was at night when they picked me up. It was Prince George's County. Okay. And when I got out of the car, went into the police station, there was a federal agent, and his name was um, Jensen Jordan. He was the one that questioned me early on when I was trying to find my children. And I asked him, what are you doing here? He said, well, we're just here to investigate a few homicides. I said, okay. So we go into the another room where there's a long table, two agents sat in front of me, one agent sat next to me. And so they asked me again, so when was the last time you seen John Allen Muhammad? I said, at an emergency custody hearing, September 2001. They said, okay, we want you to listen to a CD. Tell us if you recognize the voice. So the voice had an accent. I said, do you recognize the voice? I said, no, sir, I, I don't recognize the voice. They said, well, let me, we want you to look at this letter. Tell us if you recognize the handwriting. It was the letter that was posted to the tree outside the restaurant. Okay. Well, I said, uh, no, I don't recognize the handwriting. So it was an FBI agent walking in and out of the room. And he finally stopped and he said, look, Ms. Muhammad, we're just going to have to tell you. We're going to name your ex-husband as the sniper. I said, what? John? My head hit the table. They said, well, do you think he would do something like this? I raised my head and looked up in a corner in the room and said, yeah. He said, well, why would you think that? I said, well, we were watching a movie. I don't remember the name of it, but he said I could take a small city, terrorize. They would think it would be a group of people and it would only be me. I asked him why would he do something like that, but he changed the subject. They said, well, Ms. Muhammad, didn't you know you were the target? I said, well, no, why would I think that? I said, well, there was a man that was shot six times. They took $3,000 and his laptop. That's right down the street from you. There was another man that was shot in the abdomen at a convenience store. That's two miles from you. Ms. Muhammad, you were the target. Would you like to go into protective custody? I said, <laughs> you got to ask me that? Yeah. They said, well, yeah, because some people don't want to go. I said, okay, have you caught him yet? They said, no, ma'am. Do you know where he is? No, ma'am. And you still have to ask me. 
Yes, we do. Okay, I want to go into protective custody, but we have to go home and get my children. So that's when we went home and got my children. So um, because Lee Malvo is from Jamaica, I'm assuming that... Antigua. Yeah, and, uh, Antigua, thank you for correct. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that when you talked about the... When you talked about the... Or hearing the accent, I'm, I'm assuming that that was his voice. Right. Okay. It was. And so did you know Lee Malvo at I all? I did not. My children knew him. So your kids knew him. And for them, he was their friend. So he was a, because again, so let's go back because in the intro, you know, he took, uh, he took the kids from you basically right. and went to Antigua. He had them on a weekend visitation and okay. didn't bring them back. Okay. And so he was in Antigua and you didn't know where they were. Didn't know where they were. So you didn't have, you didn't have no, conversations with them. So what were you doing before we get into that piece? What, you know, the sniper piece, uh, what were you doing during that time at 18 months when the kids were gone? Going out of my mind. So I you, was in hiding in a shelter with my name changed. And nobody knew where I was. So you had a new identity. This is even before the DC sniper. Before that. So before before he sent everybody just going crazy all over the country, you were in hiding. In the hiding. kids were already the kids were already taken. Right. So how did you end up sort of going in hiding once the kids were taken? Did did did, did you go to a shelter and they say the you know what was that process like? I mean when he when he took the children I stopped eating. Okay. I was I ate a half a slice of bread and crushed ice. So my body shut down on me. I was signing for a package for Mother's Day for my mom because she lived with us at the time and I passed out. That's when I went to the hospital. They took me to the hospital and found out I lost three units of blood and they had to admit me and give me a blood transfusion. In that process, John called the hospital. So there were people watching me and was reporting back to John all of my movements. And where was he at the time? Was he, I don't know. So you don't even know he where he... He had the children and I didn't know where he was, but other people knew and didn't tell me. Wow. And so I'm in the hospital. He calls and says, how you doing? I said, I'm good. I said, why won't you let the children call me? He said, we don't always get what we want, do we? Prior to that, he told me, you have become my enemy. And as my enemy, I will kill you. So I had two choices. I could go back to him and die. Or I could hang up the phone and never see my children yeah. again. And die slowly, basically. And die slowly. So he, because John no. has... No, he was going to shoot me He was going to shoot you. But he has head. a military background. So it's almost like in his mind... I'm the enemy. You're the enemy. And, and so his motto was one shot, one kill to the head, never leave an enemy behind. And so, so I knew I was going to die. So but when you guys got married, were both you guys Muslims or did you guys convert together? Later. So much later. Much later. So much later. And um, and that's the myth that, that's out there is that we were Muslims when we met, but it was much later. Okay. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about sort of connection with Islam. Mm -hmm. So his thing was you were the combated enemy in his mind. This was like a war. And, right. and the kids was like, sort of like the collateral. Was the collateral right. And so then you went into you hiding. Them as pawns to get yeah. me back. And, and so is as as you talk to women about abuse, is this sort of common that you see with yes. a man or the partner? Because it could be a woman as well. Right. Using the kids as the pawn. They are used as pawns. Wow. They're used to either uh, they either kidnap them, hold them, and not let you know where they are, or kill them. So were there, prior to him taking the children to Antigua, what are some of the signs that, that came up that you sort of observed? But when I asked him for a divorce okay. and he moved out, that's when he stopped. So he, he still had a key to the house. He would come in in the middle of the night. I would hear the key going in the door, but I would lay there without moving. He would come in, walk around the bed, lean over to listen to me breathe, stand up and walk out of the house. So he, this dude was playing a, a, a serious psychological he game. He was. He changed my phone number several times. He uh, disconnected the phone. He would tell people around us that I was emotionally unbalanced, imbalanced. And if she comes to you about anything about me, don't believe her. She's just emotional. And people listen to him. So when he took the children on a weekend visitation, prior to that, I wrote went to court to get a restraining order. And I wrote down in my petition everything that he was doing because there were several times where I was in the living room and I heard the door 
uh, knob and I would hide and he'd come in and I say, what are you doing here? Then and where were the kids? Out, were sleep. the kids? The kids were they sleeping. Were so he right. would come in at nighttime. In the middle of the night, right? One, two o'clock in the morning where he thought I was asleep. So what led up to the divorce? Like, what was the issue with their science? But he prizes? was having multiple affairs. Oh, so he was having multiple so we, affairs. we had our own mobile auto repair service. And okay. in that repair service, he would uh, petition the women for favors to fix their repairs, cars. Huh? <laughs> he was getting some repairs in. I'm the fix-it man. All right, there we go, John. That's right. it. So he was he was literally laying something, huh? All right. right. And, and so there, that's and what there was did. even one woman that was going to sue the company for sexual harassment because she felt that the only way she was getting her car fixed was to have sexual encounters with him. So this led to the divorce. Right. And then once you decided that you want to divorce him, the brother just couldn't handle it. He said, I don't want to and divorce it, And if you all have not seen Mildred, she is fly. So I can only imagine him losing his dog on. I don't know what them other jokers was looking like, but <laughs> and he probably, once you said it was done, it was over. It was over. And, was so he, and so he so he lost it. And so then you filed for divorce. Uh, did you have to change no, the law? No, I had to. I had filed for a restraining order. Restraining order. order. And in the restraining order that the judge read, he told me I needed to get away from this guy. This is the judge. This talking. is the judge. Was I there said, any Your abuse Honor, at I'm really all? trying no physical. So no physical That's abuse. That's why 80% of victims do not have physical scars to prove that they are victims. We concentrate on the 20% because that's a physical and we're visual people. And, and what are your thoughts about that for, 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 for women like you who don't have bruises and, and say judges like me that are men and we see you come to court? Well, it's just not judges like Women yeah. too. So women, women as well. Right. So it's, if if I don't have a scar, if I don't have a busted lip, if I don't have a black eye or cut up or anything, then it's very difficult for them to believe that you can't take you can't take somebody yelling at you, you can't take somebody psychologically abusing you. John gave me fifty dollars a month for food to spend on my mom who was a diabetic and had heart issues, and three children and myself. $50. So I didn't eat. I had to take it to a spiritual level and say I'm fasting. That way I wouldn't feel hungry, but my children and my mom would be able to eat. My son recognized me and he said, Mom, why are you not eating? I say, Well, I'm fasting. He said, You're going to be the cleanest Muslim I ever seen. <laughs> yeah. I said, It's okay. He said, Is it dad? Yeah. Is it dad, Mom? I just took a spoon of food. And ate it because I never spoke badly, not then and not now, to my children about their dad. And that's an important message to women. As I as I travel and lecture a lot, Mildred, I um, that's the one thing I say is that be mindful of what you're sharing about the father or the mother, because you know the kids sort of take take on that energy. But the kids eventually are smart enough. The children are eventually smart enough to figure out sort of what's working and what's not working. Yeah, so, but, but when you speak badly of them, yes. right? You're also speaking badly of the children because they're not all me yeah. and they're not all him. Well, what type of dad was, what type he of was father was? Dad. So he, he was, was a great, great, he was a great dad. He loved them, played with them. Great. So he had that part. He had that part down. But it was the other piece that the he just part. couldn't connect with. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So um, throughout the process of the divorce and separation, what what was the reaction of the young people, your children? What what were they feeling? What What, what conversation were they having? You mean before he took yeah, them? Yeah, but before he took them, yeah. Nothing. We Nothing. just they were six, seven. So they didn't and really eight. know. They were young. Yeah. So he was providing, but they didn't really right. know. And he's dead. Okay. Right? I mean mm -hmm. you 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 have children, right? So it's six, seven, and eight. Your dad is like your superhero. Dad, right? Yeah. It's just dad. Dad wouldn't lie to us. Indeed. Dad wouldn't hurt us. Dad wouldn't do anything wrong. And so you never you never used them as pawns never. like he was using them. He as was using them. Say, okay. it's your mom's fault that we're no longer together. It's your mom's fault that, that I'm not in the house anymore. It's your mom's fault. I didn't say anything. I just took it. Now, how did you, fast forward back to Antigua, how did you get the kids back? They were gone for 18 months. How did you, get, how did you regain custody? By that time, I was in D.C. and living in Maryland. My mom had gotten sick, so I moved from the shelter in Washington State to D.C. to help my sister to take care of my mom. I got a call from, the, let me tell you this part right here, because I called the FBI and told them that my children were no longer in the country, because that's a federal offense. 
we take the children out of the country without the other parent knowing. So they came over and I explained to him uh, what had happened. And he said, well, how do you know your children are no longer in the country? I said, well, my cousin is a private investigator. He says when the trail runs cold, that means that the people you're looking for are no longer in the country. So he took my paperwork, sent it back to me in two weeks, and said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. But since this is an ongoing case, we're going to refer you back to Seattle. Gave me a number. I called that agent. I told him that I'm in hiding for my life. John is looking for me. He's taking the children out of the country. He said, Ms. Muhammad, since we know he's looking for you, what we want to do is put you in the middle of a parking lot and use you as a decoy. This way, we can lure him out. So how did you feel about doing that? I said, that? excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it's going like to be. A, like a I true crime guy. Now you the parking lot and shoot out in the middle. I so said, did it's you... going to be a, a headshot. You're yeah. not going to know which way the bullet is coming from. They say, we're just trying to help you out. And I hung up the phone. So you you declined? Did not do that. That I would have been dead for real. No, John is a John Man, what was fools. A, John I, was we an need his expert badge number. shot. Expert. So they wanted to put you he in the middle of a parking would lot. Would not have missed. Headshot would not have missed. So August the thirty first, I got a call from the executive director from the shelter I was living in, and she said, "Millie, I think we found your children." children and Millie is my safe name that's the name I had to change it to so nobody would know where I was I thought that was like your hustling name no on that's the that's <laughs> back in the that's day what the women thought the women it was like <laughs> Millie what's she you know the high roller Millie you know Millie Millie <laughs> that's what the that women was your code name. that was my code name wow that's my safe name okay. so I don't I don't use that so um I faxed the paperwork to the detective who she told me to and he said well Miss Muhammad you know we're on the border of Canada and if he gets across the border we will not be able to get your children I say I appreciate that information but could you please go and get them? so August the 31st at 4 35 p.m. that detective called back and he said Miss Muhammad we got your children so where was where was your ex-husband well he was there they, they so they got the kids from they, they no they went to the school where they were he had them under assumed name so they changed, so names. changed their name. Wow. So when they got my daughters and brought them into the office, they asked them what were their names, and they gave them their fake. Name. And so the police officer said, "No, those are not. That's not true. What's your name?" And they started crying and said, "That's okay. You're not going to be in trouble." And that's when they said, "Selena and Talib." So your mom has been looking for you. So my son. And they don't know any of this. They don't know that they had been kidnapped. They just thinking that um, it's a that he told them that I was coming. They were going on vacation, and I was coming. That must later. be a slow. What you slow. what you on the underground railroad? You, <laughs> you coming eighteen months later? <laughs> you know, and I and, I, and I'm, I'm so glad because I want the people to listen because I know this is a serious subject. But to show how you a survival to be able to look back mm-hmm. at this and laugh at the foolishness of what of yes. what this has done to you because again. You've already overcome that major I have, obstacle, I have. and your babies thought that their mother was coming, that right. they was holding on to that little hole. They was hole. holding on to that. And so you are, you arrived there. They came to, on American soil. No, I went to Washington. So you State. went to Washington. I had State. to go back for an emergency custody hearing. And so once they picked the children up, they put them in CPS, Child Protective Services. So he and I had to go to court. Both of you. Got Me it. and John. And you hadn't even seen this hadn't guy. Hadn't seen him, scared to death. So you I, were terrified I, I, coming I, into court. I, I cannot, I, there are no words that I can articulate the type of fear I felt. Even though he didn't hit me, I knew he was going to kill me. And were you by yourself when you came into the courtroom? I was, I had an attorney and an advocate from the YWCA in, in um, Pierce County. So you ain't had no brothers from the hood. There was and like no, no FOI, no nope. cat. Nope. So you, so let's talk about that. How were you able? What, what was inside of you that 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 gave you that strength to walk in that courtroom, being terrified and not knowing what was going to happen to you or to your children? I can only say that it was my faith. It was your I faith. Was, I was scared. I was scared. and scared for your for yourself, for or scared life. for you. I was scared for my life. I was scared that he was going to kill me because John didn't miss. You understand? John 
was an expert shot. He was a hand-to-hand -hand combat expert. He could, if you remember MacGyver. You went way back, MacGyver. That's John. Yeah. And had you seen a weapon him? out of so you yeah, saw him do I've this? Seen there, yeah. Everything. He was a man of his word. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Old school. He yeah. said he was going to kill me. I believed him. Nobody else believed him. I believed him. Well, no doubt. So, in my so mind. you get the kids back. I want you to walk us through that when you saw well, you when you saw them for the very first time. Well, in the courtroom, mm -hmm. can I take you to yes. that part? Mm -hmm. We go to court. And the judge says, we're here today to decide who gets custody of the children. John starts yelling. He like, says, you deciding? That's said, interesting. You on a, what are you saying? I'm not going to see my children again? He said, you have to go through the same process she went through. And because her paperwork was done pro se, which meant I did it myself, and it is in perfect order, she will get custody of the children. So he gave him a document to sign. He signed that document and flipped it back to the court. Oh, he did. Case dismissed, right. And so we waited until he left the courtroom because he was furious. We go into the hallway because the attorney is calling CPS to find out where the children are. And as she's calling, I feel a presence behind me. I turn around and look, it's John. I take off down the hallway because he is so coming. So he didn't he, leave the no, courtroom. No, he's coming. And my attorney and my advocate looked at me. They looked at John, and they ran too. They we ran from they him. They ran too. This dude just they ran. he like the gooch man. <laughs> they ran around the corner. So no, where was? But where was the police during this? Nobody was on. That See, and that's way. the unfortunate. So you you win this court case. He was supposed to leave. He was, and he did not. He did. Was not. he chasing you? Oh, you all just took off. We running, took so off because he was he was coming. He was walking very hostilely. And that's when I felt his presence. And I turned around. I saw him. I ran. My shoes went everywhere because I had on high heel shoes. Clicked them off. off I'm the pump, done. Son. Right. Yeah. And my, and when we ran around the corner, we looked back. He put his hand on the courtroom door, looked at me, and said, "Gotcha." My attorney said, "Oh hell no." Dealing with a lie. We yeah. gotta get out of here. We gotta get out of here. So we go to the substation in the courthouse. Ask the police. Tell them what's going on. Say, can we leave out of your back door? They said, no. You got to leave out the front door so just like no, everybody else. No support. No, no police. No security. Nope. Not Wait, what, what? Where was this? What state was this in? Washington State. Washington Tacoma, State. Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma. So I need to make sure I stay the hell out of that. <laughs> and I love, I love that area. But I would not go to court. And that's unfortunate because, again, you feel like that the system is fair. I mean, you won the case. But then you're being threatened. They felt me on so many different levels. It's not even. And the faith is what kept you only moving. Yep. So I mean. you you run so you I, run out the courtroom, right? And she and, and we find out the children are at Department of Health and Human Resources, which is two blocks away. So we get there, and we park. First person I see is my son. He's mm -hmm. getting out of his now car. Tell me your son's name again. John. John, John Jr. Okay. He gets out the car. He's trying to wear an afro, but he has that dome, I guess, a, a, a mohawk. I yeah. don't know. And he also has the pants on his butt. Okay. So I walk over to him and I say, I'm so glad to see you. And then I'm pulling up his pants. I say, but is this going to be an issue? <laughs> <laughs> Such a mama. Such a mama. Then I hear my daughters uh, coming down the elevator. Mommy, mommy, mommy. And I walk over to them, hug them. I'm saying, I can't see you. I can't see you. My attorney say, look. The man is trying to kill you. We need to leave like now. Wow. So we get in the car. My children look at me. You know, they sit back and then they look at me and they say, Mom, Dad said he was trying to find you, but he couldn't find you. I say, Really? I say, Yeah. I said, Okay, let me ask you a question. I said, If your dad wanted me to find you, why did he change your name? Silent. So we get to the shelter. I give them a shower. They call up their friends. One of their friends, um, he won a TV at, at um, his elementary school. He sold the TV and brought me the money and said, please find my friend. So called him, called my mom, say, mom, I got him. I got him. So we had to wait till it got dark. 
We went in the basement of the YWCA around the swimming pool. Through the clothing closet, there's a red door. We open the door, there's a car. Get in the car, we drive 45 minutes one way to SeaTac, the airport. Security picks us up at the car, take us to their security office. Once the pilot is ready, he radios security. Security escorts us on the plane. We get on the plane. We land at BWI September 5th, 2001. Now, is this a private jet or this is just Regular a commercial? Plane, United Airlines. They so sat who, us in the back of the plane. Who actually set that up? Was this government? Don't know. What you don't know? It wasn't government, but I don't know. Um, wow. It could have been so, the YWCA. The, I'm so, pretty sure it's the YWCA. So why did you come to the, the Maryland area? Because my mom was Also, oh, your mom was here. Right. Because right. you guys are originally from Louisiana, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As we say, Louisiana. Louisiana, you yeah. From Louisiana. Back there we go. Rouge. Where y'all make groceries. Back to Rouge. Back to Rouge. We make groceries, make groceries and right? we finna go you to finna. the store. And you answer yourself. <laughs> going shopping. Yeah. And I'm like, are you? did you just ask yourself and answer, answer yourself? <laughs> Correct. So you ended up in D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kids, um, you know, I'm assuming you guys went to counseling. No. You know, so you didn't go. So We tried was, counseling. Unfortunately, I must have come across every unethical counselor because they were trying to be famous. The DC Cypher's ex-wife said this or his children said that. So I went to the library. I got a book on counseling and learned how to counsel me and my children. And so let's talk how the how the children are doing now and tell everyone their names and ages and what they're doing right now. Well, John is 28. Okay. He um, is an assistant manager at Sunglass Hut. Okay. He went to Louisiana Tech University. Oh, that's yes, right next did. door to Grandma. Yeah, that's where he went. I used to go in that library quite Uh-oh. a bit. Uh, so I'm sure he hung out at Grandma, too. That's what his I sister I don't know. Are. He didn't tell yeah, me, he but we'll tell see. You that. <laughs> he went, uh, Selena, she went to Baldwin Wallace Conservatory. She majored in vocal performance and sing classical music in eight different languages. Taliba went to Cleveland State University, majored in vocal performance, and she sings opera in eight different languages. They formed a group called Two Music, and they dropped their EP about a month ago. Okay, so there, there we go. So let's talk um, before we wrap up. So now you are an author. Uh, you've written several books. I know five. Uh, that um, five books. I have an autographed copy of Sacred Silent, which scared, de- silent. scared Silent, thank you for correcting me, uh, so sort of which details your day-to-day experiences that. So you have several books. You're, what are you doing right now? Right now I'm an, an award-winning keynote speaker. I speak at military bases, churches, domestic violence conferences. Uh, my audience are professional individuals as well as victims, survivors, and advocates, and children. And so what do you want people to know about Mildred Muhammad uh, and, and, and Mildred's story? Because we're not going to give this guy too much energy, but what do you want right. people to know about you? Well, I would like them to know that just because you are a victim or a survivor of domestic violence or any victim of, or any crime, does not mean that you will not heal from it. If you continuously tell yourself, that I will never heal from this, that I will never get over this, that I will always think about it, then you will. Because you have to speak into existence the type of life that you want. I'm completely healed from my situation. I can talk about this as we're doing, get up and go have a good time. I don't have any nightmares, any flashbacks. I have none of that because I did the work in the journey in trying to uncover every emotional pain that would attach me to him because he wasn't going to control me from prison and he wasn't he's not going to control me while he's dead so you have to make a decision of how you want to live your life and i choose to live my life through the lens of joy instead of the lens of well that is a great way so mildred muhammad thank you for coming to sound bombing um and we can you just share with the audience uh, how they could get in contact with websites, anything of that nature. You can go to my website, Mildred Muhammad. Muhammad is M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. MildredMuhammad.com. If you want me to come and speak at any event, you can send me an email and you will receive a response within 24 hours. I also have my 
internet TV show. It's called the Mildred Muhammad Show dot com. You can go there. Also, I'm a certified intuitive life coach. And if you need a coach, then you can contact me at myfocusllc.com. All right, Mildred, I want to thank your producer, A. I mean, your, I, I want to thank your agent, AJ, for allowing you uh, to be here, getting you on time, giving me the directions. I want to thank my producer, Darius Wilmore and Supreme for our music. Uh, Kevin, uh, the owner of Nancy's, for allowing us to record at his location. Mm -hmm. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen and that some people miss the message because they are too busy looking for the mistake. Thanks for mm -hmm. tuning in and do something for someone other than yourself today. I'm your man, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, and you've been listening to Sound Bomb. Peace.